2000, when Roundup resistant horseweed, a weed species that had not been previously resistant to Roundup, was discovered in Roundup Ready crop fields in Delaware. While scientists have validated what farmers were discovering in their fields, the nation's lead regulator of genetically engineered crops, the United States Department of Agriculture, has been looking the other way. Every time a pesticide company petitioned the USDA to deregulate a new herbicide tolerant variety of crop, USDA determined that the introduction of the new crop would have, quote, no significant impact, unquote, on the farming environment. But recently, the department's indifference to the indirect consequences of their deregulation of Roundup resistant crops has caught the attention of two federal district court judges. They independently struck down the USDA's deregulation of Roundup Ready alfalfa and Roundup Ready sugar beets. They found the USDA to have unreasonably and arbitrarily dismissed the environmental consequences of deregulating genetically engineered crops. In one instance, the judge found that USDA could produce no written record that it had ever considered the impact on farmers. Nevertheless, Roundup resistant weeds are hurting farmers. They are imposing a billion dollars in additional weed control costs. They threaten cotton growing so profoundly that they've been compared to the bull weevil. And the solution may be worse than the problem. To combat Roundup resistant weed proliferation, the pesticide industry recommends to farmers that they use more and more toxic pesticides on newly engineered crops that will be tolerant of those more toxic pesticides. That will surely lead to more environmental pollution and, as we shall see, the collateral damage of crop destruction and even more costs to farmers. In today's hearing, we will show that the USDA's passivity lies in stark contrast to the EPA's active approach in preventing pest resistance to genetically engineered crops it regulates. We will show that the USDA's legal authority is no less broad than EPA's legal authority. However, USDA views its broad authority, authority much too narrowly, while EPA views its broad authority appropriately. Which approach has the better track record? Passive and self-constrained, USDA's approach has plainly allowed the proliferation of herbicide-resistant weeds. In contrast, EPA's record of prevention is a relative success. Perhaps we are at a crossroads for USDA's policy of passivity towards superweeds, having been reversed by two federal courts with scores of farmers needing relief from the cost and consequences of superweeds, and with a new administration determining policy at the department, it may finally be the time for the Department of Agriculture to re-examine its approach to the deregulation of genetically engineered crops and to make a change in policy. It should be a change that would help prevent the proliferation of herbicide resistant weeds. It should be a change that would preserve efficacy of a relatively benign herbicide. It should be a change that would de-escalate the trend to more and more toxic pesticides. It should be a change that would muster, that would pass muster with federal courts. It should be a change that would protect the long-term interest of farmers, consumers, and the natural environment.
Chair recognizes uh, distinguished chair of the full committee, Mr. Towns in New York. I appreciate you being here, Mr. Towns, and I appreciate the, uh, uh, the leadership that you provide on the full committee. I want to thank you, uh, first of all, for holding this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. Um, and I know that um, you realize the importance of it because the Congress is not even in session. And of course, this hearing is still taking place because of the, the importance of it. And of course, I want to just uh, thank my colleague for uh, moving forward with it um, because uh, let's face it, uh, this is a very, very important hearing, and I think that sometimes, you know, we forget all about in terms of how important it is in terms of farming and uh, something that we sort of pushed aside, you know, and uh, I think it was Mr. Uh, uh, Louis Perry, a cotton grower in Georgia whose family, you know, has been farming since 1830, told a reporter that herbicide-resistant pigweed posed a legal threat to cotton farming in Georgia. I mean, so it talks about in terms of uh, how important it is. So um, if we don't whip this thing, if uh, going uh, to be like uh, the Boweaver, as it was pointed out, you know, and of course, um, it, it, we have to make certain that we stay on top of it and stay focused. So I want to uh, thank the gentleman who comes from an urban area that um, understands how important this is and, and spending time and focusing on it. So um, I want to let you know that um, uh, from the full committee standpoint, we stand ready to uh, support you in every way. But I'm happy to know that you're getting the message out because it's important uh, that we do so. So again, thank you for taking time and to be here even when the House is not in session because uh, uh, you um, felt it was important to uh, continue without cancellation, and I want to salute you for that. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Mr. Chairman. I, I want you to know that, uh, well, it's true that I'm in a primarily urban area. There are a few small farms in the southern part of my district, uh, but I became aware of this in part through uh, meeting with farmers across the country uh, during the time that I was campaigning nationally for the Democratic nomination. So I, I've had the chance to um, actually be on farms, talk to farmers about their concerns about uh, the issues that are raised in, in this hearing today. Uh, there are no additional opening statements, so our subcommittee is going to receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I would like to start by introducing our panel. The Honorable Ann Wright is Deputy Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs at the United States Department of Agriculture. Previously, she served as Senior Policy Advisor to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid on Agriculture Committee Matters. Before joining the staff of Senator Reid, she was a lobbyist for Consumers Union on Energy and Trade Issues. Previously, she worked with farmers and nonprofit organizations at the Sustainable Agriculture Coalition in Washington, D.C., and served as a policy advisor on agriculture issues for Senator Paul Wellstone of Minnesota and Senator Paul Simon of Illinois. Mr. Sid Abel is the Assistant Deputy Administrator for Biotechnology Regulatory Service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. In this role, he helps provide oversight of risk-based introductions of regulated genetically engineered biotechnology crops, as well as conducting and providing oversight of broad environmental risk and imp impact assessments uh, complaint with the um, National Environmental Policy Act. Prior to this, he served as the Associate Director with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Pesticide Programs. He worked for the EPA in various capacities from 1989 through 2007. Uh, Mr. Abel will not deliver testimony, but will be available to answer subcommittee members' questions.
The Honorable James J. Jones is the Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator of the EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. He's responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the office, which implements the nation's pesticide, toxic chemical, and pollution prevention laws. The office has an annual budget of over $260 million and more than 1,200 employees. From 2003 to 2007, Mr. Jones served as the Director of the Office of Pesticide Programs. In this role, he was responsible for the regulation of pesticides in the United States with a budget of approximately $150 million and 850 employees, making it the largest EPA headquarters program office. I want to thank uh, each of the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee. Uh, it is the policy of our uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Now, uh, Mr. A uh, Abel, even though you're not making an opening statement, I'm going to ask if you would agree to be sworn because uh, your uh, answers to your questions will uh, put your testimony on the record. And I would ask that all the witnesses uh, rise. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. I ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement is going to be included in the record. So what we want in five minutes is just try to get a sense of what you want to communicate to this committee. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Ann Wright. You're the first witness on the panel. Uh, please begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss USDA's biotechnology regulatory programs and the issue of herbicide-resistant weeds. Uh, first, I would like to emphasize that US, at USDA, we support all forms of agriculture, including conventional, genetically engineered, and organic crops to meet the nation's and the world's need for food security, any pr energy production, and the economic sustainability of farms. All three of those methods of production must be strong and viable. As the world's population increases, the demand for food is growing and the land available to farm is shrinking. We need innovative agriculture production systems to not only maintain the competitiveness of the United States, but also to fulfill growing food needs. Biotechnology is just one tool to address those needs, but it's a critical one. USDA's role in regulating the products of biotechnology is carried out in coordination with EPA and FDA. Through the Plant Protection Act, our Animal Plant Health Inspection Service regulates those products that may pose a plant pest risk, while EPA and FDA use their authorities to address the safety of our food supply and the safe use of pesticides. USDA's biotechnology regulatory program, which has been in place since 1986, is rigorous and science-based. Since the program began, we have effectively overseen nearly 30,000 field trials at 86,000 locations and deregulated over 75 products. While our current biotechnology regulations have been effective in ensuring the safe introduction of GE organisms, we're constantly learning from our experiences reforming and refining our first-rate program to protect American agriculture and the environment. As part of those refinements, we are always looking at ways to improve our program. Chief among these is our effort to update our biotechnology regulations. USDA is examining the policy issue raised in over 66,000 comments <clears throat> that were submitted on our proposed regulations with the goal of better positioning the agency to address new challenges while meeting current needs. Our biotechnology program has evolved as the number of environmental issues to be considered under NEPA has grown, as well as in response to several NEPA-related lawsuits. At the same time, it's important to remember that we have made thousands of regulatory decisions without legal challenge, and just as important, not one of our plant pest risk determinations has been overturned in court. 
You also asked me to discuss how USDA approaches herbicide resistant weeds in relation to GE crops. A key point is that while the consideration of herbicide resistance in weeds under NEPA informs our decision making and we are fully committed to meeting our NEPA obligations, USDA's biotechnology regulatory decisions are ultimately based on plant pest risk, consistent with our authority under the Plant Protection Act. It is also important to note that the development of herbicide resistance among weeds is natural and, a, and an evolutionary process. It is not exclusively associated with GE crops and that GE crops provide many benefits such as reduced pesticide use and decreased soil erosion thanks to no-till farming. And we want to preserve those benefits. We must also be cognizant that if we limit the use of herbicide tolerant crops, farmers will likely have to return to older, less environmentally friendly weed control methods. Because herbicide resistance is an important issue for the agricultural community, USDA has multiple agencies engaged on the issue through research and education, as well as partnerships with outside groups and other federal agencies. For instance, our National Institutes of Food and Agriculture's Competitive Grants Program provided $4.6 million in 2009 research for bi the biology of weedy invasive species. Further, NIFA's extension outreach programs provide the connection between scientific research and its application on farms through training sessions, field days, and other outreach to growers. USDA's Agricultural Research Service has nearly 4.4 4 million in herbicide resistant weeds research in fiscal year 2010, which is part of 36 million it's dedicating to all weed science issues this year. And APHIS has partnered with EPA and the Weed Science Society of America to better understand the extent of herbicide resistance in managed ecosystems, as well as the methods being used to manage herbicide resistance in weeds. We are fully committed to working with our partners to identify potential solutions and alternative techniques to address herbicide resistance. This will require a coordinated effort by everyone involved, the government, Congress, researchers, the agricultural community, technology and crop protection companies, and public interest groups. At USDA, we are looking at the broader conte context of herbicide resistance beyond just its relation to biotechnology. We look forward to working with our partners, including all in Congress. Together, we are confident that we can find solutions that make sense. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Jones. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich, Chairman Towns. I'm pleased to appear for you today to discuss the Environmental Protection Agency's regulation of transgenic BT crops, as well as EPA's involvement with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in their assessments of the environmental impact of herbicide tolerant crops and herbicide resistant weeds. Under the coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology, EPA regulates products produced through biotechnology that are intended to have a pesticidal effect under its authorities under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act and the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. EPA first registered a transgenic BT crop in 1995. Over the past 15 years, BT crops have substantially reduced the need for growers to apply older, more risky conventional chemical pesticides to corn and cotton crops. Because sprayable BT formulations are naturally derived organic pesticides, they are very important to organic farmers. Given the importance of this technology to organic agriculture, as well as the favorable environmental profile of BT as a pesticide, EPA has, from the very beginning of its regulation of transgenic BT crops, required registrants to market these products with specific mandatory insect-resistant management requirements. EPA would consider, consider the development of insect resistance to BT toxins to constitute an adverse effect on the environment. These IRM requirements have evolved as the science has evolved, and we have altered and tailored the IRM requirements to match the latest and most relevant scientific data and information. USDA regulates genetically engineered herbicide tolerant crops, while EPA regulates the herbicides used on these crops. In order to coordinate our reviews, in 2001, the agencies developed a memorandum of understanding that outlined the agency's respective roles. In 2007, in 2007 responding to increases in reported cases of resistance, EPA and USDA held discussions on the extent to which herbicide-resistant weeds were occurring in herbicide tolerant crops. 
As a result of these discussions, EPA and USDA initiated a project with the Weed Science Society of America to develop a comprehensive manuscript to better understand the scope of herbicide resistance in genetically engineered and non-genetically engineered cropping systems. The report is due later this year. As glyphosate resistant weeds have become more widespread in herbicide tolerant crops, technology providers and users have become more open to efforts to address herbicide resistant weeds. The support for resistance management from technology providers and users has spurred the development of strategies to prevent or manage herbicide resistant weeds in herbicide tolerant crops. EPA and USDA are working with researchers and professional societies to expand resistance management education and promote research aimed at increasing the understanding of the best practices and strategies for pre preventing and managing herbicide tolerant weeds. EPA is also working with pesticide registrants, encouraging them to include mechanism of action information on herbicide labels. This information is critical to the implementation of resistance management plans which typically involve rotation of two herbicides with different mechanism of action as a proven strategy for preventing or delaying development of resistance. Recently, US, EPA and USDA have reinvigorated our efforts in this area to promote resistance management in herbicide tolerant crops and preserve the, to preserve this valuable technology. We look forward to working with this committee, our fellow agencies, our stakeholders, and the public to ensure an environmentally and economically healthy country for all Americans. Thank you, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I would like to begin the uh, first round of questions uh, with Ms. Wright. As you know, the USDA, um, since they began deregulating Roundup Ready corn, soy, and cotton, among other genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops in the late 1990s, Wheat scientists estimate that there are up to 11 million acres of American farmland and a dozen species of weeds that have evolved to be resistant to Roundup herbicide. The result for farmers has been greatly increased cost of weed management, and the probable loss of Roundup as an efficacious weed control chemical in large parts of the country. Is it the position of the USDA that it could not regulate genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops in order to prevent the spread of herbicide resistant weeds? Um, Mr. Chairman, USDA recognizes the development of herbicide resistant weeds um, across the board. Um, this is what does that mean? It means it's a, we recognize it as probably the number one issue for farmers and ranchers, whether they're raising crops using biotechnology or, or organic um, or conventional seed. I think um, we have a number of ways that we're looking at this through our um, active and dedicated research programs that are looking at critical national priorities like um, the sustainable production of um, bioenergy climate change, um, global food security. We continue to, to see this issue as critical to farmers' bottom line. Um, and right now, um, we have confidence in a science-based process that regulates in and around our plant protection authorities. Our statutory commitments are to that act. Um, well, you know, that, that's very interesting, but the question that I ask, is it your position that the USDA could not regulate genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops in order to prevent the spread of herbicide resistant weeds. That's correct. Our statutory authority allows us to make regulatory decisions based on plant pest risk. Tell me more about that. Well, the, uh, what I can tell you is that um, the plant pest risk is determined by um, well, and I'm going to let... Well, you know, let, let me go to Mr. Jones a minute. Uh, Mr. Jones, the EPA has taken a different position. EPA believed that it could regulate one genetically engineered plant variety in particular, those containing the Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis gene, in order to prevent the development of pest resistance to Bt. Is that correct? 
That's correct. We're operating under a different statute, in this case, uh, FIFRA. Now, Mr. Jones, I understand the EPA has been regulating BT crops to prevent, to prevent pest resistance for about 15 years. Is there a problem of BT resistance in this country comparable to the problem of Roundup resistance in weeds? There's there, not. No. Pardon? No, there's not. Are there 11 million acres of BT resistant farmland right now? We're not aware of resistance yet. How many, how many acres of American farmland have been infested with BT resistant pests? We're not aware of any. It doesn't mean there isn't some. It, well, is BT still an efficacious uh, pesticide in the United States? It is. Does it concern EPA to learn that weed resistance to Roundup is now widely prevalent? Yes, it does. Well, if so, why? The glyphosate Roundup is, um, has a very favorable, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, environmental profile. And so it's a compound that um, we think it's in the interests of the environment to have a long commercial life. So you're saying that it's because the uh, glyphosate is relatively benign. Is that what you're saying? It has a very favorable environmental profile. <laughs> okay, okay, Miss, Miss Wright. Uh, 11 million acres of infested farmland. $1 billion dollars in added weed control costs to farmers, the loss of efficacy for a relatively benign pesticide in many places. These are some of the consequences of the USDA's position that it could not regulate Roundup Ready crops to prevent the evolution of resistant weeds. Now, Ms. Wright, you say in your written testimony, quote, there must be a plant pest risk to deny a full deregulation. And herbicide resistance does not constitute a plant pest risk, unquote. Now I'm questioning your legal interpretation as to whether it's well-founded. Your position is that the sum total of the USDA's authority derives from Section 411 of the Plant Protection Act, which gives the Secretary authority to prevent the introduction of plant pests. But that is not the sum total. The very next section of the Act, Section 412, covers your authority to prevent the spread of, quote, noxious weeds, unquote. Section 412 gives the secretary authority to prohibit or restrict the movement of any plant if the secretary determines that the prohibition or restriction is necessary to prevent the dissemination of a noxious weed within the United States, unquote, from the statute. Now, noxious weeds are defined by the statute at 7 U.S.C. section 7702 as, quote, any plant or plant product that can directly or indirectly injure or cause damage to crops or other interests of agriculture or the environment, unquote. Let's write a plain reading of Section 412 gives the Secretary the broad authority to restrict the use of Roundup-resistant crops if sound science determines that those restrictions are necessary to prevent the spread of Roundup-resistant noxious weeds. How can you come to Congress and insist that, effectively, that Section 412 doesn't even exist? Well, first let me say that this USDA is very committed to um, looking at all of our programs and policies and ensuring that they're um, there for all forms of agriculture. I, I know you're not, this is your first time before a committee. It is. And, and, I, <laughs> and I do appreciate you being here. I asked you a question, and I'd like an answer that was not responsive. We interpret our existed, existing authorities as those focused on plant pest risk. Back in March of 2009, we issued a set of updates to our rules and regulations that expanded our authorities into the Noxious Weed Act. 
We're now looking at 66,000 comments on those rule updates. This is a new administration. We'll be taking a close look at the full range of comments that came in and, and be looking very hey, carefully at where our you, authorities are. Are you familiar with Section 412 of the Act? No, sir. You're, you're really not? Before the end of this hearing, I'd like staff to uh, have a copy made of four, Section 412 of the Act and provide it to the witness because if uh, the regulatory agency is not fully familiar with the extent of its authority, it may be one of the difficulties we're having here. I think the agency is probably very familiar, but I personally am not. I'm sorry. Well, I can understand that it's a new administration and that you're new and you do have a very good reputation where you come from. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, you become familiarized with the Act and with the sections that, uh, uh, that I've articulated, particularly Section 412, which actually does change the role of your agency and your office to effectively regulate herbicide-resistant weeds. I mean, if, if you, you know, I'll take you at your word that you're not familiar with it, but um, um, what I glean from that, since you, ha you are not familiar with it, you can't point to any pr provision of the Plant Protection Act that would deny the USDA the ability to use the authority of the section to prevent the spread of Roundup resistant weeds. I think it's clear from your testimony that the USDA's position is not so much a legal judgment as it's a statement of policy. And that it's been the policy of the USDA not to use the authority that it does have under Section 412. Just very clear. I just want to make this statement to you as uh, the, the chairman of this oversight subcommittee uh, that it's, it's that a plain reading of Section 412 um, makes it obvious that if the agency wants to become involved in the enforcement of um, herbicide resistant weeds, that it could do it, that you do have the statutory authority to do it and that it's a policy question. Now, you may not be the person who makes the final call on that, uh, but somebody uh, all the way up to ag the ladder at agriculture is making that call, and this subcommittee is determined to see the statute enforced. Um, now, Ms. Wright, I know that the department understands at this point, that the problem of super weeds is a crisis. What I don't understand, and what defies comprehension, is this, that the department does have the legal ability to help farmers deal with the crisis and to prevent it from worsening, and that the USDA has not made a policy a decision to use this authority or has made a policy decision not to use it. Do you have any, uh, anything further that you can tell the subcommittee? I, I, you, you will read the statute. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I promise to fully read the statute. And I, I would like to say, um, and thank you for the opportunity that to address this problem and to address the entire issue of coexistence. Uh, we're going to have to have a full slate of partners at the table looking in the, at this, including Congress, as well as um, technical service providers, other federal agencies, um, regulated entities, and public interest groups. And together, I think, we'll be able to, um, to solve this problem, including growers. It's not um, one that as well as the markets, it's not one that exclusively rests on our shoulders. Ms. Wright, I want to draw attention to the department's view that it currently has authority to regulate future planting of GE crops through administrative actions. 
The Department outlined three such actions in a court filing from July of this year. I move to insert into the record the fourth declaration of the APHIS Administrator, Cindy Smith. My question, Ms. Wright, is this. Is it also the Department's view that it could, by means of any of those administrative actions, place requirements on a permitted planning of GE herbicide tolerant crops to prevent the proliferation of herbicide resistant weeds? In both the case of um, GE alfalfa as well as GE sugar beets, there are currently formal petitions before the agency for us to look at ways to partially deregulate these. So, so, so that's a yes. We are in the process of looking at that. So yes. that's a yes. So, the industry has come to us and ask us to look at that option. So, is this consistent with the testimony that has been given in court? Yes. You you found expansive authority to devise three administrative actions allowing you to approve large scale planting under a permit system. What is the basis? You have or have No, it? sir. Um, the industry came to us and asked us to look at partial deregulation as one way to allow the planting of a GE crop. Are you talking about the cases that were struck down by federal district courts? That, that, was, that was at the request of the industry, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, what's the... I'm still trying to figure out the basis for your view here today that a permit system in which the GE crop would remain a regulated article would nevertheless not permit you to place requirement on planning a and planning aimed at preventing the spread of Roundup resistance in weeds. Unless we've determined that there's a plant pest risk, we do not have that expansive authority. So you're still, st you're still stuck on uh, one section of the act and haven't read the other. Uh, Mr. Wright, isn't it true that the department has had under development a new biotechnology rule? and that the rule was also under development during the previous administration? Yes. Okay, and, and with a change in administration, uh, can a Congress, this Congress, expect to see any differences in the Department's approach to herbicide-resistant weeds in the rule you're now working on? I can tell you that we're having internal discussions about our policies in and around coexistence and that we just honestly cannot afford to look at um, options and alternatives that are not supportive of various cropping systems including biotechnology, organic and conventional. They all play a very critical role in the health of our rural economies and in, in our agricultural economy. I, I know, I mean that was in your opening statement, I, I heard that. Uh, but it's not responsive to the question I asked. Um, Can you ask your you question again? you want to try again? again? Will you please restate your question? There's been a change in administrations. Can we expect to see any, department, any difference in the department's approach to herbicide resistant weeds in the rule that you're now working on? I think we're looking at all, a lot of options and we're going back and looking, considering the comments that were submitted. Um, we're internally having discussions across the department. We have a secretary and an administration that's very committed to the idea of uh, addressing the issues of coexistence, and that's as much as I can say today. See, the, the, the thing that I'm concerned about, and, and I am, I'm, I'm really trying to give you the benefit of the doubt on what you're saying. The thing that I'm concerned about is that when you go back to your talking points, you, you actually in, 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 inadvertently shut the door on, on consideration of the science and experience that's been brought forward through the EPA's enforcement, through um, uh, 
through the practical experience of, of farmers, through the ABC report. And, and so I'm trying to, because it's important that we understand, um, you've made it clear that the policy, you know, what the policy is, you're not, you haven't extended that to a legal interpretation, uh, but if, if you're just saying, well, you know, we have different ways of, of uh, supporting agriculture, we're gonna try to support them all, but if, if, you, if you rest on that and don't go deeply into expressing to this subcommittee a concern that the extent to which herbicide-resistant weeds may represent a, um, an attack on the rights of farmers, the economic rights of farmers, the environment, if you don't articulate that, it, it, it causes me uh, to... Uh, To pause. Out of all due respect, I would say that um, it's not that we don't recognize this as a bottom line issue for farmers and ranchers. It's what? It's not that we don't recognize this as a critical issue for farmers and ranchers, but I think um, this administration and USDA see biotechnology as being a very important tool for farmers to use in addressing some very critical issues globally and here domestically. And all of the options that we look at have to be supportive of that. They have to encourage and support innovation in a smart way. Do they look the other way if there's a problem? No, I don't think so. We take our NEPA process and documents very seriously. In fact, the Secretary just approved a reorganization of our BRS services. We have a whole team, a new team, a whole program dedicated to NEPA now. We have a budget increase um, request before Congress for 2011, fiscal year 2011, of $5.8 million to hire new scientists. We take these issues very seriously, and as we learn more about the environmental impacts of this technology, we try to adjust and we try to make our rules and reg regulations. Just out of curiosity, you think that genetic, you know, you just talked about the importance of biotechnology. Is it your view, personally, that genetically engineered crops are the functional equivalent of conventional crops? Well, I'm not prepared to reflect on that. Okay, that's fine. I, I, you know, for the last couple decades, the EPA and the USDA have pledged in various memoranda of understanding to promote integrated pest management. One of the key objectives of integrated pest management is preserving the efficacy of relatively benign pesticides and pre present, preventing herbicide resistance in weeds. Now, I move to insert into the record uh, one such uh, memorandum of understanding from 2001. Now, to the EPA, I want to uh, address this question. Does it concern the EPA from the perspective of integrated pest management that more and more acres of farmland are showing signs of infestation by Roundup-resistant weeds? Sir. Yes, it does. Now, in, in general, isn't the proliferation of Roundup-resistant weeds across millions of acres of farmland a setback for integrated pest management? Sure. And to the USDA, does the USDA agree with the EPA that from the perspective of integrated pest management, the widespread infestation of Roundup-resistant weeds constitutes a setback? That's right. Sorry. Can you please repeat that? Does the USDA agree with the EPA, which just responded yes, that the proliferation of Roundup resistant weeds across millions of acres of farmland is a setback for integrated pest management? I asked you, do you agree with the EPA? from the perspective of integrated pest management, the widespread infestation of Roundup-resistant weeds constitutes a setback? Poten um, possibly, yes. Uh, Mr. Jones? In communication with the majority staff, the EPA has stated that the USDA did solicit EPA's input in its environmental impact statement for Roundup Ready alfalfa. But as we've already seen, the environmental impact statement will not consider any measures for preventing the spread of Roundup resistant weeds. USDS testified that EPA raised no objection to their draft environmental impact strategy on alfalfa 
which USDA characterizes as meaning, quote, the EPA had no concerns, unquote. Is that a complete representation of EPA's comments to USDA on the Roundup Ready Alfalfa Environmental Impact Statement? Uh, Chairman, to be fair to our, my colleagues at USDA, you know, I, I'm asking you yeah. to, to, to answer the question, I will. not to be fair, but to answer the question. The answer to the question is that in the agency's formal response that went through our Office of Federal Activities, we did not raise the issue of insect, uh, or, I'm sorry, herbicide resistance in informal conversations when we've had a number of them, and they continue to this day. So you did raise a concern about weed resistance right. management, is that right? That's correct. Now, Ms. Wright, um, this is somewhat at a variance with the written testimony. Uh, and contrary to that, does the USDA now acknowledge that the EPA did in fact express concern about the weed resistance management issue in the alfalfa environmental impact statement? Yes, we do. Mr. Jones, did USDA ever ask EPA to offer its expertise in preventing pest resistance in the context of the USDA's preparation of an environmental impact statement for deregulating GE alfalfa? Once we raised the, the concerns that we um, have identified through informal mechanisms, that led to an ongoing dialogue between USDA and EPA um, to, to address those. And so those they, did conversations- they ask you, Did they ask you to offer your expertise? That's correct. What did they ask you to do? When we raised our, we raised some issues associated with resistance management in, as, it, as it was characterized in the EIS, and the department said to us, you've raised some very good points, let's talk about that, we want to understand this better, and those conversations continue, as I said, to this day, and I believe will continue until we feel like we're on the same page on that issue. Well, given the scientific verification of the rapid spread of Roundup resistant weeds, do you think it might be justifiable? for the EPA and the USDA to revisit the question in preparation for the final environmental impact statement for Roundup Ready Alfalfa, Mr. Jones? I believe that's what we're doing right now. And uh, to Ms. Wright, given the EPA's successful effort thus far in preventing Bacillus thuringiensis resistance in pests, wouldn't it make sense for the USDA to want to utilize the FDA's expertise to help develop a regulatory means to prevent and mitigate Roundup resistance in weeds. Uh, yes, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask Sid Abel to address more of the specifics around how we are working with FDA. Well, he's sworn he can, uh, he can do that. Um, we are right now, we're working very directly at the staff level with um, our partners at US um, at, at the EPA um, to address specifically the issue of glyphosate tolerance um, among weeds. We agree both with EPA and with other parts of our federal um, partners that this is a serious issue for, for farmers. It's also a serious issue for the technology. Um, we see that this is a uh, very favorable compound to be used in controlling weeds and to preserve that technology is very important to us. So we've entered into these discussions with EPA at the staff level, with the Weed Science Society of America, and, um, and with others um, in universities and extension agents to get a better handle on the extent to which glyphosate tolerance is occurring out there, not just in GE crops, but also in conventional crops. Um, we believe that uh, by going through this process, we'll be able to put forward some um, strategies for managing these crops in a way such as it will preserve these technologies into the future. Have you read Section 412 of the Act? Uh, it's been a while, but yes, sir, I have. Would you read it again? Yes, I would. Thank you. I want to thank the members of this panel for uh, participating in this important discussion. And this committee will continue to retain jurisdiction over this matter, uh, which means that there will be more hearings. Uh, we are very interested in the policies of the USDA uh, as it affects the environment, farmers. And um, I'm grateful for your presence here today and for the EPA's 
um, continuing work in this area as well. Uh, the first panel is dismissed. I'm going to call the second panel to come forward. And uh, we'll begin the second panel in a couple of minutes, as soon as you're all in place. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read the introductions uh, at this moment while staff is, uh, is getting set up here. I want to welcome to this uh, subcommittee uh, Congresswoman Van Watson, uh, Ambassador Watson from California. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, gracing this hearing. Appreciate your presence here. Um, we have here today uh, Mr. Steve Smith. Mr. Smith, welcome. Mr. Smith is Director of Agriculture at Red Gold Inc., the largest privately held canned tomato processor in the country. In this position, he works closely with their growers in Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. He's co-chair for Red Gold's new sustainability initiative and serves on the Cisco Corporation's National Sustainability Advisory Board. Mr. Smith has served on the Purdue University uh, uh, Dean of Agriculture Advisory Board, the Board of Directors of the Mid-America Agriculture and Horticulture Services, as Director of the American Fruit and Vegetable Processors and Growers Coalition, and, and as an inaugural member of the Indiana Department of Agriculture Advisory Board. Thank you for being here, sir. Dr. Philip Miller currently serves as Vice President in the Monsanto Company. He leads the regulatory group which is responsible for the development of health and safety research on new agricultural and biotech products, global regulatory approvals, product safety defense, and management of numerous key scientific and regulatory issues. Dr. Miller joined Monsanto in 1994 and has held numerous roles spanning chemical discovery and biotechnology research and development. Some key roles include